Thank you, and thank you for joining us. It's 30 years ago since tonight's guest embarked on a career in pop music. Since then, he's survived the pitfalls of a whimsical industry and become a permanent fixture in pop's hall of fame. He was a star as a kid. 30 years later, he's still that. Ladies and gentlemen, Cliff Richard. Thirty years on, eh? Yes, I know it's amazing, really, isn't yeah, it? Still enjoying it? Very much. I think I enjoy it probably more now because uh, there's so much more you can do. I mean, when you know, when the Shads and I started off and we toured around and we played places like Leeds and Bradford, places we can't get to because halls aren't big enough anymore. They used to hand you like a gas mic and said, "Get on with it," you know. And the Shads would sort of set the volume. At, if it was a, a two thousand seater, it would be volume number four, and that would be it, you know. And now we've got sound systems and lighting effects, it's magic now. And that's much more fun, is it, than the, than the early days? Yeah, because artistically you can do so much more for the public. I mean, you can actually create 
fantasy moments, and, mm. uh, and I, I find it really challenging and really good. I much prefer it today. A lot of people still say, oh, those were the days, and I say, no, they weren't. <laughs> There's no pretensions about what I try to do. I don't pretend to try and have a message for every song. Uh, it's just a matter of making good pop rock music, and mm. that, that's kept me uh, uh, very light when it comes to my music. I mean, I'm, I'm not bothered about being heavy or progressive. If you allow your, your tastes in music to just filter through, if, if you allow the influences of all the people around you to just filter through your record, it's inevitable that you will remain contemporary, which mm. is what's happened to me. I'm very fortunate. Well, you must be doing something, right? You've been doing it for 30 years. I mean, yeah, it's... I don't know whether you can put your finger on anything, though. Uh, I mean, I, I do, but basically, I have to tell you, I, I make records for me, you know. Yeah. And uh, if I get the goosebumps, I, I, I say, oh, I must record that song. And uh, then you just chant. You put it out and hope that a lot of other people get boost, goose, boost gums. <laughs> boost, boost gums well, is very good. I as like well as that, gums. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, where, where, I've been, where I've been fortunate is that the, uh, the boost gums have actually <laughs> <laughs> coincided often enough to make me have hits over the years. But saying that you're, you're, you're in, you enjoy it now more than you did in the 60s, but is it the same as saying that you wish you were starting now? Rather oh, than, no. No. No, because to be fair, I think that the people who start these days have got 30 years of experience to actually build their careers on. And when we started, you know, the three chord trick, they used to say that none of us could play more than three chords, and actually it was true. <laughs> um, although we got very quickly into four, uh, and, and the shadows realized they had to get beyond the three chord trick. But when we started, basically all that was needed was that. We only had, you could write almost, well, most of those rock songs, all the Tutti Fruities and uh, you know, Elvis records, they were all three chords, basically. Mm. And uh, you could get away with it then. Nowadays, you see, if we started with the same amount of talent as we had then, I don't think we, well, I think we'd be non-starters. Mm. I mean, these people like George Michael and, and Paul Young's and all that, I mean, these guys are really good at what they do. Yes, but there was also, too, a lovely sort of innocence, do-it-yourself aspect of pop in those days. I mean, you made your first demo disc in one of those recording booths, didn't you, in, yes. uh, in Oxford Street? That's right, the HMV store in Oxford Street. Yeah. And funnily enough, you know, uh, there were, I think, only three or four copies made. I dumped three of, well, I think I dumped them all somewhere some years back, and I believe at Sotheby's, they found one and sold it for £3,000. I should have kept it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a dreadful record. Is it bad? Well, it's because we just <laughs> stood around one of these gas mics and did a song called Breathless, and then for the B-side, it was Lordy Miss Claudie. Mm. One was a Jerry Lee Lewis hit, and one was an Elvis hit, and it, we weren't that good, to be honest with you, and the recording technique was not that good, so we didn't come out of it that good. Mm. Let's go back right to the, to the very beginning um, of, of, of your life, in fact, because you were born in India. Yeah. And I've not really talked to talk, talk you before about, about that childhood. You left when you were seven, but, but do you have strong memories of what India was like? Funnily enough, well, yes, I suppose I have, but I quite often wonder, and I check out with my mum sometimes, I say, D did this really happen, or is it just something that's merged with something else? And as an adult, I think I remember something as a child, and it perhaps wasn't like that. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of one thing that I wrote in a book of mine where I said I didn't realize that monkeys could swim. And not only that, I remember sitting at the edge of this great lake and watching monkeys holding each other's tails in a great long line flop into the water and come out the other side. Now, I'm not sure if that's possible, mm. but my memory of it is pretty vivid. My mum did say that where we used to holiday, there were lots of monkeys and they did used to jump into this tank of water. So, uh, who's to say? But my memory of it is quite sharp, I, I, and sharp enough to write about it in, in fair, fair detail. Do you remember also, it was a time of home rule, wasn't it? A partition in India. And, uh... Just 47 they got home, uh, home rule was in That's India, right. and it made it difficult for us as a family to live out there. There was a lot of fighting going on, sort of uh, the civil war kind of situation. And my father stuck it out and did quite well because most of the local Asians thought that my father had a gun in his house and because he used to hunt, but in fact it had been stolen ten years before. And so we, we lived there until my mum got really scared and said, I'm off to Australia. No, my dad said he's off to Australia. My mum said, bye bye, I'm going to England. <laughs> so my dad came to England, fortunately. Uh, you might have been a Bee Gee had you gone to Australia. <laughs> yeah, I could <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what it, the, but the life you had there, of course, I mean, it, it was, the, it was the sort of, not quite the Raj, but it was quite privileged, wasn't it? You know, well, it was the Raj, it was the mm. tail end of the Raj, mm. and yes, I mean, I, again, I, my, my mother forgives me now, but I, I think I upset her once by writing in this, this aforementioned book that uh, perhaps Britain got more out of India than it put in. Mm. Uh, it's quite often the case when, you know, empires are built, that often happens. I wasn't trying to be cruel, it just seemed to me that, for instance, we lived very, very privileged lives. I'm glad we did, though, because it made a terrific contrast when my father brought us to England. We were really poverty-stricken. I mean, it was really... Was it bad? Well, he arrived in England there. My youngest sister hadn't been born, so there were still five of us, 
parents of three kids, and he arrived with five pounds sterling, and that was it. If it hadn't been for my grandmother who gave us a room for a while, an, an aunt later on who let us have another room, um, we wouldn't have managed. And when we finally got into a council house, my father built the first three chairs that we used to sit on. I can remember my mother crying night after night because, you know, when you've had a an fairly comfortable, easy life, to be thrown into something you cannot relate to, mm. like poverty, it must have been difficult for her. For right. us kids, I don't, I don't remember feeling upset or sad about it, just, uh, it was just the norm, I suppose. I, it, for me, it didn't matter that we'd come from, you know, uh, this, this uh, rich life into a, a poverty-stricken one. <laughs> what about school, though? I mean, that must have been very different for you, too. I mean, uh, being yeah. accepted or not accepted by a new group of people. Well, in fact, funnily enough, it, it, I was quite swarthy then. I mean, I'm swarthy now because I've been to Australia. But, uh, although it's wearing off, isn't it? But uh, in India, obviously, as a child, I'd kind of lived outdoors and in shorts all the time. So when I arrived in England, I'd, I was kind of brownish. And uh, or I remember them... The thing that annoyed me was that they kept asking me where my teepee was. Because <laughs> I'd said I'd come from India. And, of course, you know, my dad said, well, tell them they don't know what they're talking about. Teepees are red Indians. This is, you know, Asian Indians. And, of course, you know, this little seven-year-old go, I'm an eight, I come from Asian India, you know, not teepees and all that. And I used to get into terrible fights because they kept calling me Indibum and all that. Indibum? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they'd never even seen it. <laughs> I, to... uh, I hate to say this, but I used to fight almost every day for the first year of my life in school in England. And it was, you know, I used to arrive at the, in the playground and then because this business about being slightly different, you were ostracized and, uh, and I used to just fight all the time. Either that or put up with being kicked around by ten bullies. And uh, so I used to come back black and blue and, you know. But I think it was good for me. I enjoy it now because I now know that I could do it if I wanted to. And, but, and also the other thing too about the, 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 the poverty. I mean, does that give you a kind of touchstone for the rest of your life? I mean, having gone through that. Yes, I find it very strange that nowadays, for instance, you know, those of us who have been really poor, for instance, and make it, and therefore are now no longer poor, because I can't, I'm not poor, not at all. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm a wealthy, I was going to say young man, but I'm wealthy. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of people say, though, and it's really strange, if, if you try to say something about the poor, uh, it's almost as though now, though, because I, I'm no longer poor, that I have no right to yes. have any say on it or understanding of it, whereas in point of fact, having experienced it for those early years of my life, I'm really grateful now. I mean, I, in fact, that's probably why I still apologize to my accountant if I buy a suit. <laughs> but uh, coming again from that background then, I, I suppose that, that really inevitably what your parents were looking for you, and you were possibly looking for too, was a safe job. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, yes, I mean, I it's... took over, I worked in my father's, my father worked for a, a company, uh, and I, he got me a job in the office. I mean, just to make sure that I got something and clerical jobs were fairly safe, you know, white-collared stuff, and I guess... If, I, if this hadn't happened to me, I, I would have knuckled down and been, a, been in, a, in an office somewhere, doing what I'm not sure, because I, I don't really have no qualifications in that area, certainly not now in my life. You obviously refused to settle for that. There was something else you wanted. Yeah. What was it? Was it fame? Yeah, I suppose basically it was, because, again, funny enough, I think psychiatrists and all that say that there's always a connection. There's a, there's a thread that ties us all together, those of us that make it. <laughs> because a lot of people, my story is not at all unique. A lot of people, rock and roll stars or actors or whatever, come from, you know, deprived areas. And it's really strange because I can remember all that. I never thought, hey, I'm deprived, I must get out of this. I heard Elvis. And I thought, oh, this is unbelievable. Because before that, of course, I'd heard Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, Perry Comer, Rosemary Clooney, Teresa Brewer. They're all really good singers, but they didn't inspire that little spark in me. And when I heard Elvis, I was totally inspired and totally influenced, and initially, I wanted to be like him. He became the teenage rage, everybody screamed wherever he went, and I wanted that. Well, do, when you look back at yourself now, 30 years on, back at that, that kid who was trying to be Elvis Presley, tell me, describe him to me. What was that kid, the, the Cliff Richard who went on stage? What did he look physically, like? Physically, I'd say that I was a greasy slob, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen, I've seen, it. well, it's true, you know. I've seen pictures of me doing Oh Boy, and, uh, <laughs> And the funny thing, the greasiness comes from the fact that when Elvis came out, he had the great sort of pompadour haircut and everything. And the only way I could keep, because I've got fairly fine hair, the only way I could keep it up was by getting grease. You know, and if you couldn't afford brill cream, it's straight out of the frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> and it used to, you know, so there was this greasy sort of look, and, um, and I did slob around a bit. I mean, I didn't wear particularly great clothes. I was probably the first real bad taste dresser in this country. You know, I used to wear pink socks and... <laughs> 
pink jackets, you know, and fluoresce around the place. And then you had that lip too, didn't you? That sort of... Oh yeah, I, I can't do it as much now. <laughs> I, uh, I saw, oh. I saw, <laughs> but there has been a, there has actually been a physical change because I look at photographs now, nowadays and I'm slightly bald in the eyebrow, whereas I used to have really good Dan Dare type eyebrows, you know. <laughs> I used to practice doing the Dirt Bogard bit like that. <laughs> what with that and that. <laughs> you can see what I mean, I was just a greasy slob. <laughs> you were also too, of course. I mean, it's interesting to, again, look at 30 years of what you are now to what you were then. You were actually, I mean, hailed as a very, very dangerous creature, weren't you? I mean, the press had headlines like, uh, is this man dangerous? To too sexy for television. Too sexy for television. It uh, was true, of course. It was. <laughs> it, it, it still is. It still is. It still is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I... I have my theory about all of those things. The media uh, get smashed around quite a bit by those of us who they write about. I think sometimes deservedly, sometimes mm. not. Mm. But in, in, the media in general, though, tries to create things. Particularly when America had Elvis, we didn't have anybody. So uh, initially they did it with Tommy Steele. Well, I mean, Tommy again. Tommy, I think, one of the wisest pop singers ever because he... I don't think he was that great at it. So what he did was he found what he was really good at and did it and became one of our probably top entertainers ever. Mm. And, and moved out, so that left a gap still. And along came the greasy slob, and, and I was trying to be like Elvis anyway, and had, there's a kind of stance and look that you did, the prototype did it, so you copied. And so I got this, I was Europe's answer to Elvis, and therefore they had to stipulate that I was too sexy for television and all that kind of thing. Um, I, 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 don't know, I don't know what they were playing at, but it, in fact I didn't mind, because I used to read things about uh, his eyes smolder, so, I mean, all I did, I used, to, I used to laugh, and the ch shadows would read it out to me, we all have a giggle, but when I went on stage, I used to think, right, smolder, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was all under the brow. <laughs> but, I, but I also smoldered because I didn't like smiling too much, because I had a, there's one, I have one capped tooth, and this is it here. Before, it was a small tooth that grew slightly inwards, yeah. and therefore, if I was lit from here, which is mostly how they do a spotlight from out front, and I smiled, it, this tooth threw a shadow, and it looked like I had no tooth there. <laughs> So rather than do that, I suggest smolder and not smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a cliff of, of, as I say, of 30 years ago. We're going to take a break now. When we come back, we're going to talk about the cliff of now. All right, so okay. we'll see you in just a couple of minutes. See you then. Welcome back. My guest is Cliff Richard. Cliff, we were talking there about the, about the early days, and you mentioned there the fact that you, you were ambitious, you wanted to be famous, you wanted to be Elvis Presley. Well, it's one thing doing that, it's one thing achieving something like that. The other thing, of course, the other question altogether is surviving. Yeah. Uh, d did you actually, very early on, draw up a kind of battle plan for survival? Or was there something, a single influence in your life that, that, that led to survival? There wasn't a battle plan because... Um at that particular time in my career, I, it was so early that I hadn't thought of longevity at all. I mean, I assumed that I might last a couple of years, I don't know, and uh, if I'd lasted two years, then there was a possibility that I might make five, and then ten would be a bonus. But I mean, as the years went by, it was, in fact, it wasn't until about the tenth year that I thought, wait a minute, we're now, my career is now into what you could start terming as the, the possible having longevity. and. Uh, and, but there wasn't a plan. I'm not sure that you can plan it because everything is so hinged with the rapport that you have with an audience, with the crowd in general. You know, we were laughingly talking about goosebumps in the early part of the show, but it's basically true, you know. Inspiration is half the, half the thing that one has. You, in, you have an inspiration that you think this will be right, and then you put it out, fingers crossed, and in my case what's happened is that it's been right most of the times, for my audience anyway. Mm. And so therefore it's gone on and on and on, and I've tried to diverse and made films and done TV series and, and uh, plays on the stage and stuff like that. And if there's a plan, it, 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 it happens slowly. Mm. I would say now that, now that I've reached 30 years, I, I, much, I spend more time planning than I ever did before. Mm. Well, what part actually did religion play, though, in, in your survival? You mentioned, in fact, that in, dis in disenchantment with it, with, with the industry you're in, you were going to leave, <clears throat> yeah. but you didn't. Yeah, it wasn't so much that I was disenchanted, it was just that I felt as a Christian I had no right to the privileges that I was enjoying. And I, I think it's a big mistake that people make because usually what guilt does is that guilt makes you do things that sometimes you regret later. Um, for instance, if I want to give now, if I want to give my time to charity, it's not because I'm feeling guilty. I might be guilty of all sorts of things, but I don't feel guilty. I feel really grateful and so therefore I give out a gratitude. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't think I was disenchanted with, with the thing. It's but just that I felt I, I couldn't play... 
a complete Christian role in my industry. And at that time, I truly believed that. So I thought, I must be honest with myself and to myself. So therefore, I'll leave it. I didn't want to leave it. I liked my I mean, What it means, of course, is, is that the, the job you were doing wasn't ultimately fulfilling, was it to you? No, that's right. It mm. wasn't. No. no, in the end, when I finally became a Christian, it seemed to me that, that rock and roll was not doing everything that it should have done. Be but there again, you see, I don't think anything can. I, well, again, I'm biased, of course, but um, I think that what mankind has done is forget that basically we're 50% physical and 50% spiritual. Maybe it's even more in terms of of spirituality but what we've done is we've cut out the spiritual side and we want happiness in spite of that I just decided that rock and roll was not making me as as happy as I thought it should and, and so, so I looked in another direction right. and I found my faith yes now, now that's not unusual that because I mean uh, people in your particular industry uh, any industry have looked for other things to, sure. to drugs for instance uh, to booze to, to mysticism to, to whatever it might be yeah, that's right the point is though what, what's interesting and, and perhaps you can, you can sort of answer this is that if you have somebody who sits here and says you know uh, I turn to booze or somebody who comes on and says I'm a capitalist or I'm a communist or whatever people listen to the point of view and think oh that's alright if you come on and say I believe in God I'm a Christian somehow you become a crackpot don't you have you noticed that is yeah that what, I, I must admit so I it, felt that more in the early days of my Christianity Maybe I did it wrong. Maybe I maybe I came on too strong. I don't know. But there was this feeling that oh, well, you know, here comes the crackpot, here comes the god slot, um, and it was a real put down. I um, wonder why though that should be. Do you see why? Why is it? Is it that people are embarrassed by by, yeah, by I, facing up to, to to the thing or what? Yes, I think over the years there has been an, an embarrassment has grown, and I guess partly it's the church's fault. It hasn't had a rapport with the general public. It's be, it's it can be criticised. No, it's, again, I'm generalising. This is not true of the church in total. But certainly it can appear to be holier than thou. Um, it, as I say, in some churches you can walk in and the language is 400 years old. Uh, how does one relate to that? And I, I went through all that when I became a Christian. I thought, well, I, mean, what, I know what Jesus has got to do in my life, but where does the church fit in? I don't even understand what they're talking about. So the church has created something, I think, that the general man in the street can't relate to. What I hope to do in my life is to say, look, you know, I'm a rock and roll star. I didn't have to have Christianity. Why do you think I chose it? And I have often used the illustration you've just given, the fact that why is it that people turn to mysticism, the Eastern philosophies? Why do they turn to drugs? Why do the Beach Boys go into whatever they went into? Mm. Why did the Beatles go to a cave out in India somewhere? Mm. Because ultimately, the thing that all of you, and, and myself and yourself included, chase, which is financial gain, fame, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with either of those things. I've enjoyed both of those things all my career. But ultimately, what we're showing in our lifestyles is that that is not sufficient. That there will always be a gap until it's filled, until your life is complete. Again, I say I'm biased. Of course I am. But I believe that it's the spiritual aspect. Once that's filled, you then I now enjoy my career much more. I'm far more enthusiastic than I was... 15 years ago. What's enviable, of course, and, and what, uh, what some people might, <coughs> might find uh, difficult to believe because they don't possess it, is the certainty that you have. I mean, I, I, that's, that's, I mean I, you, you're, you're certain in your faith. Yes. You're certain there's a heaven, there's a hell. Yes, I am, but you see, they're almost the wrong places to start. My certainty of, <coughs> of those facts is because of my certainty of the existence of Jesus. Um, I can't prove there's heaven or hell, but I can sure give a lot of proof as to the existence of Jesus. I mean, you know, did you know there was more evidence to prove that Jesus actually existed on this earth than there was that Julius Caesar? And yet no one doubts that Julius Caesar existed. No. So my, all the certainties you talk about mm. are based on this historical fact of this man mm. who I followed through and ch tested his story. It was when I dealt with him and his claims on my life that everything else became certain. Mm. But they but, go back to that moment. But I mean, but supposing it's always the thing, the problem, isn't it, with, 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 with the, a belief like that, the belief that you've got to heaven, that the, there's life ever outlasting, and, and uh, supposing you're wrong. <laughs> okay, if I'm wrong, all I will have done in my life is propagate goodness and love and, you know, and be part of charity concerts and try to propagate peace between people and stuff like that. But then suppose you're wrong. I mean, I'm not saying that you don't believe, but supposing I should I'm right. I should make an awful lot of people I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what I mean? If I, if, no, I, I, I take the point. If, if, the, if the fact is right, then, then what the rest of the world has to do is say, well, where does that put the rest, the rest of everybody? Well, uh, what, what interests me, though, is, again, is this, is this business of the, the persona you put over. It leads inevitably to this kind of uh, uh, investigation of this. People... Uh, suspicious of people who are yeah. sort of... Uh, uh, less and less now, though. Less and less. Well, I mean, what's interesting, too, of course, I'm going to do this one first of all, is the message you were, you were five years ago putting over was deemed to be slightly unfashionable. Things have changed now, and what you've been saying, of course, is now very fashionable, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I know. It's with funny. AIDS and all that thing. I mean, well, that's right. And also, it's even to do with um, the charitable side of my life, which I've been involved in, f well, ever since I became a Christian, 22 years ago. 
Um, but Bob Geldof became the saint for a little while. Mm. I mean, it was fantastic. I felt a weight off my shoulders, funnily enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, well, you know, I'm the one that got all the funny headlines and all that, you know, and if they were going to do a, a thing about Mary Whitehouse, I'd always be in the background with a halo around my neck, you know. <laughs> And, and suddenly it was Saint Bob, and, I, and in a way I thought, hey, this is fantastic. Now people are realizing that you can be an everyday guy, but do something good. Mm. I mean, you know, I, I can't help it, the fact that I do believe in a moral standard, and, I, and I've been swinging with that for a long time. Uh, it's interesting, though, you see, Michael, that, that the kind of morality that's coming in now, I, I'm not sure how real that morality is, because a lot of it is plainly based on the, f on the fact that, it, that AIDS does exist, and the chances are it's going to kill it's us. Mm. So a lot of it's to do with fear. Mm. I still say, though, rather that than not at all. But, uh, and maybe people will realize that, in fact, life can be rather full if one is monogamous. I, you know, I'm not the most experienced person at all. I'm not married, you know. I don't have any intention at the moment of being married. I might never be married. But all I know is that it seems to me that relationships are to do with trust and commitment. And those kind of, those areas uh, seem to be missing in a lot of people's lives. And uh, so I've propagated that fact for a long time. Well, do I, why have you never got married? There was a time when the shadows were all getting married, left, right and center around me. <laughs> and I felt really left out. Um, I just didn't feel like I could marry anybody that I knew at that particular time, but I was desperate to be married. Because it was in the air, you know, my friends were getting married, I felt kind of left out. I mean, I had thrown myself into my career, of course, so uh, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. But when I did, you know, I thought, oh dear, this is ridiculous. And then I did have one instance where I was dating a girl, a very attractive brunette lady, and uh, very early in my career, I must have been only 21 maybe, and I remember coming out of the theatre, the Finsbury Park Empire, and she'd been at the show that night, she came out, we were all in the car, I think, the shadows and myself, and she jumped on my lap, and I, I turned around to wave at the fans, and a number of them were stamping my programme into the dust. <laughs> and, that, and that frightened me. Now, in my immature state of 21, I decided that my career was far more important than losing fans. Much later, when I, when I in fact, was dating... A, a lady who married Adam Faith, in fact. Jackie. Well, Jackie, Jackie, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, again, marriage cropped up, and I, I decided then, at that stage of my life, that I didn't care whether I lost fans or not. And so I'd made myself think, well, okay, this is it. But it wasn't right for us. I mean, and, and obviously it wasn't. Mm. So, uh, and even with Sue, Sue and I talked very seriously, not specifically about marriage, because we were kind of thrown in in the way that I, I had never been thrown in with either Jackie or, or, or previous experiences. Sue and I made headlines that I couldn't believe were feasible. I couldn't understand why everyone was writing about us every day for a little while. And they were, on, they were asking us we, whether we were going to get married or not, and I'd seen her three times. <laughs> I mean, it was ridiculous. And then we were constantly phoning each other up saying, I didn't say that, Sue. I didn't say that. And she'd bring me up the next day and say, look, I didn't say that. And in the end, we agreed that we'd never say, I didn't say that again. <laughs> we would just understand that we couldn't possibly have said something stupid. Yes. Because we're not stupid people. But anyway, again, that didn't work. So, I'm quite prepared, though, to remain single. I'm not bothered by it. A lot of people, in fact, sometimes I come out perhaps a bit offensive because uh, people still have this thing about saying, oh, when are you going to settle down and, get, and be happy and get married? Well, and I think, myself, well, I'm terribly settled and I'm quite happy. Well, they either do that, don't they, or else they, they, they throw up the whole issue about your sexuality. Oh, well, they that's say, inevitable, though. Yeah. I think our industry has always had that. Always, yes. always, always. Does it, it upset you? No, not anymore. Uh, I think it used to upset my family a great deal, mm. and my mother used to feel it desperately. Mm. Uh, and, and no one ever, people don't think about that when they write things. No, I mean, they, don't, they just think that somehow or another, because we're famous, we're up for grabs and they can write what they like. And of course, in a way, they can. But, but I would have thought that there's a need for sensitivity and a bit of care and concern, even in the journalist world. There's no reason why people shouldn't be kinder. I read some real cruel things about people like myself, and I think to myself, it's so unnecessary to, mm. to say harsh or unnecessary mm. things. Uh, and as far as my sexuality is concerned, I've, I haven't wanted to talk about it, and I don't want to talk about it. I think there are other things far more interesting to talk about, and, uh, and that's it. Mm. But they still uh, obviously do uh, to try and wheedle around a bit. And what about the, the, the looks, too? I mean, you're a remarkable-looking 47-year-old. You know. really are. You're extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, I mean you, make me, you make me sick, I've got to tell you. I mean, <laughs> But I mean, but again, but you see, again, I only raise this point because, again, it, the, the, the press perceive it in a different way. I mean, is like, is he wacko jacko? You know, is he ideal? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, well, is he trying to look like Diana Ross? You know, I mean, so, yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's so. Sort of yeah. So I wonder how you react to that. You know. Well, again, I, I suppose again, th those kind of areas, because our industry tends to go in for that. I mean, personally, I don't think it really matters. I mean, you know, I, you know, if you watch the things like the last. Um, 
the uh, Oscar Awards, Cher looked fantastic. Mm. Now, if someone came and told me that she'd had everything sliced off and changed around, it wouldn't <laughs> bother me at all, because what I saw was very, very attractive and very... I mean, she looked like, for the first time in years, I saw someone that looked like a star. Mm. She didn't bother trying to make her hair look rough. Mm. She had it... I mean, it looked great. Mm. And so, if Wacko Jacko has had the operations, <laughs> then, to me, it doesn't really matter, because he's decided to play a particular role. I haven't tried to be the Peter Pan of pop. I got lumbered with that phrase uh, some time back, and I still have to live with it. I have to tell you that it creates a great pressure, because I'm not immune to what they write. I, you know, I, I am affected, and, and therefore I keep thinking to myself, oh, crumbs, I'm supposed to look wonderful in the morning. I've got to look bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And you know what it's like if you travel back from Australia or something, and you've got to meet people, you know that you're not going to look right. And my fear now is that someone's going to go, ugh. <laughs> because sometimes... I'm afraid it's deserved. <laughs> so I'm hoping that, you know... That's a very feminine thing, that, of course, isn't it? It's worrying about that, that way about your looks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it's so... ridiculous that I, we should be forced into that situation. Mm. Personally, now, I don't really care. All I know is that if I don't look 47, then I'm very, very fortunate. And it helps in my particular, the career I've chosen. Because, obviously, I want to look as energetic and as young as I can. But I, I don't make any attempts, and I haven't bothered with a knife. It's working well, wherever it is, I'll tell you. <laughs> So finally, let's, let's bring us right up to date now. I mean, you, you're 30 years, you've survived, you're, you're still a big star. There's no diminishing at all of your, of your appeal. Witness the reception you had tonight. I mean, they're hanging off the rafters in here. And always do whenever I've, I've, I've told you. But, I mean, what's the future then? I mean, I mean is, is it conceivable to be a 55-year-old rock and roller? Still singing Devil Woman. I mean, is that... Yeah, I guess so, because... That, yeah, I think yeah. so, because rock and roll has grown up as well. <laughs> rock and roll is a middle-aged art form. It's been going longer than I've been going. It's been going at least 35 years, you know, which makes it... You know, it's rock and roll menopause coming up any minute now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you see, because, because rock and roll has aged and done it magnificently and grown and progressed, those of us who began with it have done a similar thing. I can't sing the way I used to sing. I don't want to look the way I used to look. I like being what I am now, and I like the music that I sing now. As long as people like Alan Tarney and Terry Britton are prepared to write Devil Woman and Some People for me, I can go on singing them. As long as I, my, if I can keep my integrity together and perform it in a way that doesn't make me look really stupid, then I can't see why I can't be a 60-year-old. Who'd have thought that Sinatra would have made three comebacks? <laughs> At, what, he's 70-something now? That's right, he's 75. As long as he doesn't look silly doing it, I can accept it. Something like that, yeah. yes. All right. Well, I mean, we all look forward to it. <laughs> in, the mean, <laughs> in the meantime, well, th thank you for talking to me. I'm much enjoying that. And you're going to finish off now with a song. In fact, a song that you, you mentioned just then. I, uh, yes, I, I must admit, uh, years will tell whether I'll still sing it as much as Living Doll, but I've got a feeling that some people might be a, a, an all-time right. favourite for me. There you go. Thanks. Thanks.
Ha 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 